in this 88 Atheist Week's Christian Literature, we'll do the unpardonable, the unpardonable Sin by Dr. Curtis Hudson. I could have sworn I did this already, but I'm not able to find it through any of my videos. Maybe it didn't load up, or I deleted it by accident. Who knows? Who cares, right? Well, you can um, check my... You can check out KingJamesBibleOnline.com if you want to see these verses. And, you know, but here it is. You know, Matt 12, 22 to 30. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. And so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, The fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Be Beelzebub. The prince of the devils, and Jesus, wait, I'm sorry, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom your children cast them out, therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scatters abroad. He that's not with me is against me. Ah, uh, you know, there could be a third option, you know? You ever thought about that? They may not necessarily be against you or for you. They could just be neutral. But anyways, the unpardonable sin. What's the unpardonable sin? It's, a lot of Christians will tell you that it's just basically unbelief, and that's basically what this is going to tell you. You know, just simply not believing, even though you're not giving any evidence or anything like that. And I call your attention especially, especially to two verses. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. Neither is this world, neither in the world to come. Actually what he's going to tell you about the unpardonable sin is that only these Pharisees could have done it. <sighs> Sins are not un unpardonable sins. Some have suggested that murder is an unpardonable sin. He's going to tell you it's not even, no matter, how, because, you know, murderers can, act, you know, think about it. You can go slaughter everybody in the mall. You can murder, rape, do all these things, and still get saved and go to heaven. You can be the nastiest, filthiest person. This is how wonderful Christianity is. You can just slaughter everybody. That's fine. Just make sure you get saved before you die. And no matter how good or wonderful you are, and how many people you helped, how many lives you saved, how much joy you brought to people, you know, helped the elderly and, you know, orphan kids, sick kids, children with disabilities, it won't matter. You go to hell. Think about that. You know, Peter, he tells you about Peter, and then this adultery is not that part of a sin because, again, the woman in John, he talks about that woman in John I was married five times, you remember? The woman at, at the well. I remember leading one such man to Christ. You know, you know, basically doesn't think. You know, he was burdened over the fact that he was living with a woman he was not married to, and the children didn't know they were not married. He shared this with me and thought he could not be forgiven. He actually thought he was doomed for hell. So that's what happens when you put all this fear of nonsense into people's heart and minds. I should say. And I told him of the woman at the well. He wept with joy and said, Praise the Lord. I thought I could never be saved. Now I find God will save me. He trusted Jesus and was gloriously saved. They were properly married and he is now living a good Christian life. Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. Taking God's name in vain is not the unpardonable sin. You say, I don't know why you would even mention that, preacher. I mention it because it is an awful sin. One of the worst sins a person can commit. The one sin that makes an absolute fool out of a man. Not necessarily because if, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, you know. I could say, Zeus, damn! You know, fuck Zeus! Well, it doesn't mean anything. Zeus is not going to strike me down for saying that because he doesn't exist. Think about that. Every other sin has some provocation. For instance, the devil comes to a person and says, Hey, you are hungry. You don't have food. Why don't you steal money? 
there is a provocation for that kind of sin. And in a sense, a reward for that sin. If you steal something, you do have the benefit of the thing that you stole, whether it be money, a car, food, or whatever. You know, the kind of like how these priests would steal money from their congregation, the global congregation. Though I'm against stealing because the Bible says thou shalt not steal. There is some reasoning behind stealing. There is also some propagation for murder. And, you know, he goes in, you know, I'll get even, or you stole my wife, you banged her, and all that stuff. There's notes in the Schofield Bible. Dr. C.I. Schofield says that part of all sin is describing the works of Holy Spirit to Satan. I don't agree with that. I don't think that... It is done part of most sin. Some men in this town, good preachers, have ascribed the works of the Holy Spirit to Satan. They did so out of jealousy, but they did it nonetheless. We registered 1,122 salvation decisions during our neighborhood Bible time. Some well-meaning people in the town said, well, all those kids don't know what they were doing. They just went down the aisle because they gave them a piece of bubble gum or a yo-yo or some other gimmick. Well, yeah. But he's going to say, no, they came because they heard a gospel presentation and were hungry to be saved. But they're children. Of course, you could easily fool kids into this stuff. Who can commit the unpardonable sin. No saved person can commit the unpardonable sin. Pardonable. I know I'm not pronouncing it properly, but who cares? I, Curtis Hudson, can never commit the unpardonable sin. Why? Because when I was 11, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. All my sins... All my sin was pardoned once for all, forever, and the deal is already closed, shut, signed, sealed, and delivered. I cannot go back and do what I did. I'm already justified by faith. Does that mean I'm still saved? Romans 5, one. therefore being justified by faith, justification is not something that can be reversed and followed with condemnation. To be justified means all guilt is gone. That God not only forgives your sin, but He promises not to impute you unto you your iniquity. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Psalms 32 verse 1 and 2. When God justifies a believing sinner, he makes a promise that he will never again impute iniquity to that sinner's charge. I've had Christians say to me, I'm afraid I may have committed them part of a sin. I know I went forward in church and trusted Jesus, but the thought keeps coming to me that I have gone beyond the deadline. Let me set your mind at ease. If you have trusted Jesus, you can never commit the unpardonable sin. The deal is settled. This is finished. It is done. The books are closed. Your sins are forgiven. Get that settled. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. Hath, not shall have, but hath, present tense, you have it the moment you believe on Jesus. Hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. Shall not be judged again will never have the sentence of, the sin, of sin placed on him again. That is God's promise. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he that blots out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Every Christian ought to memorize that verse and quote it back to Satan when he comes, dragging up your sins and checking them before your face. John six thirty seven says, Him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. Blah, 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 blah. What is the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin is committed by enlightened sinners. Is rejection... Okay, maybe I'll, he does, is going to say what I say when I say it before. Is rejecting the Holy Spirit's plea until the rejecting sinner loses all desire to be saved. So you know deep down that the Holy Spirit and God exists. You just want to deny Him because you just want to sin. You just want to sin. Just admit it. It is important to understand that the unpardonable sin does not change the living God. God's love is changeless. God is immutable. God loves sinners. God wants sinners to be saved. I don't think you know what love is. If you think that love is sending someone to hell to be tortured and tormented for eternity, that's not what a loving person would do to someone who doesn't accept them. Sorry, but it just isn't. Because, you know, I mean, think about it. how often are you attracted to somebody who doesn't share the same feelings with you? Do you get pissed off and attack them and insult them and get violent with them? Of course not. At least not a decent person. When a person does that, what do you think of that type of person? That's what this God is. The, this God is the person that attacks and belittles and a person who's not interested in them or who rejects them. You know, you go out, ask, you know, you ask this person out. They say no. Or in my case, you know, ask a woman out because I'm a guy and I'm straight. You know, heterosexual. 
I ask a girl, she says, no, she's not interesting, or she has interested, she, uh, and she has a boyfriend. If I say, okay, that's fine, and I walk away. That's what a caring person does. Not necessarily loving, because I don't love her, because I don't know her. But think about that, though. I'm just neutral to her, and I would not attack, attack her. However, if I say, oh, you're just a bitch, you're a whore, you only want to date guys with money, you're this and that, you just want guys to treat you like crap, you just, you don't, you just don't want a nice guy and all this other bull crap. If I say that stuff, what do you think people would think of me if I did that? Think about that. That's what God is. That's how God is behaving. The book of Revelation describes a tribulation period. When devastation comes to the earth, hailstones fall from the sky weighing 120 pounds. There's pestilence, earthquakes, and a third of the population dies. Then more die. Monsters are let out of hell with a sting that torments men five months, scorpion-like creatures. But after all the tribulation described in the book of Revelation, men have no desire to be saved. They never one time turn to Jesus and say, We want to be saved, whether it says they still repent or not, but... Pray to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Which is, of course, completely unbelievable. Because if you have evidence that's different, okay, this so-called Satan that supposedly exists, he knew this God existed. If he can know that God exists and gets to decide whether or not reject him, why not us? It makes no freaking sense. Of course, I already spoke about this in my other videos, especially the idiot atheists, you know, those Bible verses, the last one of the... The last one, or the second to the last one. What happened? They said no to the Holy Spirit so many times that they can. Their continued rebellion changed their own heart. They had no desire to be saved. The unpardonable sin is unpardonable only because the one who commits it no longer desires pardon. What is the terrible thing about the unpardonable sin? What that is, I'm sorry, not what, but that. When you reject Christ, the heart becomes harder and harder. Do I hear somebody saying, even as you read this message, Doctor Hudson, if I only could. Feel like I felt when I was a child, when I heard, first heard a choir sing, when I first heard a preacher preach on hell. My little young lips quivered, and cold chills went up my young spine. Oh goodness! And when the choir sang "Just as I Am," it felt as if something inside me would pull my heart out and just drag me down the aisle. But it's easy to get kids, you know. I mean, think about it. why do you think these college professors prey on young ch on on the young on young students, you know, when they fill them up with their, you know, hatred, their, you know, their racist, anti-white, anti-capitalism, anti-male hate, their filthy, disgusting hate. Why do you think celebrities attack, you know, people who are weak, you know, who don't know much, especially college professors. Why do you think college professors, those college professors in those women's studies and gender studies classes, why do you think they prey on these kids? Because they do not... Well, I can't, I'm not, they're not kids, young adults, these young adults, because their minds are kind of empty. They don't have the experience of life. They have the intelligence, just not the experience. So you just manipulate them. Which I've said in other videos, probably. Probably not. And of course, he makes a plea with you to be saved. It's up to you to be saved. If you want to be saved, be saved. If you want to be saved, don't be saved. Save, save. What? Whatever. But now I'm going to just speak briefly, you know. You know, okay, my background is molecular biology and biochemistry with emphasis in evolutionary biology. Now, I only have a bachelor's degree. I have a book by somebody with a PhD. I don't know the name of it. Might be Darwin's Doubt. I don't know. Uh, what else could it be? I think it was Darwin's Doubt. But anyways, the guy has a PhD in molecular biology, and I'm able to spot mistakes. Because he's a creationist. And he does what almost all these creationists do. He just uses this well as one in a billion chance of a protein folding this way, one in a billion, one in a million, one in this, one in that. You know, you don't know that. He's just pulling the numbers out of his ass. That's what they do. Now, you see, I was a Christian at one time. Briefly, but at one time. But anyway, it was like two years. But let me tell you something, something, something. When you have this knowledge of evolutionary biology like I did, and you're trying to say it's all wrong, you t try to convince yourself that all this stuff you learn is wrong, and that creationism is correct, 
you know, you try reading these books, you go to these websites, creationism.com, creationalmuseum.com, or whatever the hell they are, you know, Ken Ham and all that crap. You go to Answers in Genesis, you try, do your best to do it, you know, to believe this stuff in the Bible. It causes major, major cognitive dissonance that most of you guys will not understand. And not believe. Here a preacher, well, I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe any more than it. Buildings can evolve. Buildings can't evolve, so how can we evolve? You know, he's walking down the platform like that, talking like that about evolution, and you have all these others. People, I got these, you know, I, you, I did an Indian Day 3's Christian literature. I did the one, the, you know, Evolution of the Bible, which, you know, I describe some of the things they say. But it creates such kind of dissonance that you have no choice but to accept one or the other. You can do like these people do and just throw out your knowledge and accept creationism. I just couldn't do that. It's just impossible. It's just impossible. Well, bye.